today. I think you might have seen him on Sovereign Living. Let everybody put your hands together for the great Glenn! <laughs> Wow, how can I live up to that? <laughs> this is actually a video that I uploaded already to YouTube, although it hasn't published yet. Um, this is the my YouTube channel, and um, this is the video right here. It's supposed to publish on Friday. But so depending on how this comes out, I might uh, just use what we record today. Especially with an introduction like that, I'll tell you, man. <laughs> okay, so this is about malicious. Actually, I need to change that because this is actually the third video. Um, I went with... Um, there we go. There we go. So... Um, uh, this one is about malicious. It's a continuation of the video that we did last week, or the, the PowerPoint presentation. I don't know if you remember. We did last week, maybe it was the week before last. We did. Okay. It was the week before. Right. Right. Okay. So this is, uh, this is a continuation of that one. Um, and um, so, uh, first of all, I'm not a liar. Well, I'm in a lawyer. No, I'm in a liar. You should never take my word for anything. You should always do your own research. I provided references to aid you in your research, but I don't know everything, and I'm open to any ideas. Um, there's four types of people you'll meet in your life. There's the people who try to wake up the slaves. There's the slave masters. There's the people who have no idea they're slaves. And there's the people who like being slaves. Which one are you? Do you really know for sure? Are you who you think you are? If you can see through the illusion, then you are the solution. If the people don't know their basic rights and freedoms, how can they know when or if their rights and freedoms are being infringed? And I see that so much these days. Um, you know, and never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Oh, gee, that looks like a militia. And think about it, because, you know, it, it, the, we're going to go through this more, but, but the courts have ruled that when you look at the Constitution and what the Constitution's all about, you have to look at the times in which the Constitution was written. And so everything that was going on at the time the Constitution's written is important for interpreting the Constitution and what it means and what it's supposed to mean. And so um, these men were required to be armed. Okay, we're going to go through it. Okay, they had to be armed. They couldn't, if they were outside the town more than two miles and caught without their arms of some sort, they got fined. Okay, and if they went to a public meeting without their arms, they got a fine. Boy, wouldn't that be nice today? <laughs> and, and many of the governors, the governors were all appointed by the crown. I mean, we have really similar situation to what's going on today. The governors were all appointed by the crown. So the governors didn't, didn't support them in what they were doing. They were just doing it, okay? And so think about what they did. They went out in the middle of the night and engaged the British, okay? This is what they were doing. Think about it. It's exactly what's going on, what was going on. All tyranny needs to gain a foothold is for people of good conscience to remain silent. Government is not reason, it's not eloquence, it is force. Like fire, it's a dangerous servant and a fearful master. This is John Locke, okay? Two Trees of Government, Book 2, Chapter 18, Sections 199 and 201. This is the stuff the Founding Fathers were reading. Tyranny is the exercise of power beyond right, which nobody can have a right to. And this is making use of the power anyone has in his hands, not for the good of those who are under it, but for his own private, separate advantage. When the governor, however entitled, makes not the law, but his will the rule, 
and his commands and actions are not directed to the preservation of the properties of his people, but the satisfaction of his own ambition, revenge, covetousness, or any other irregular passion. Okay? And then in section 201, it says, "'Tis a mistake to think that this fault only in monarchies. Other forms of government are liable to it as well as that. For wherever the power that is put in any hands for the government of the people and the preservation of their property is applied to other ends and made use of to impoverish, harass, or subdue them by the arbitrary, irregular commands of those who have it. Gee, that sounds like what went on with Vince. There it presently becomes tyranny, whether those that use it are one or many. This is the stuff the Founding Fathers were reading. And this is Aristotle, the tyrant who, in order to hold his power, suppresses every superiority, does away with good men, forbids education and light. Gee, this sounds like, this is textbook Obama, quite frankly, but they're all doing this stuff. Um, uh, forbids education and light, controls every movement of the citizens, keeping them under a perpetual servitude, wants them to grow accustomed to baseness and cowardice, has his spies everywhere to listen to what is said in the meetings, and spreads dissension and calumny among the citizens. Calumny is lies, Okay, and, and gee, that sounds like the news media, um, uh, and impoverishes them, is obliged to make war in order to keep his subjects occupied and impose upon them a permanent need of a chief. Well, Biden could fall into that, so could uh, Obama, so could uh, uh, Bush, both of the Bushes, and, 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 and uh, Clinton. You know, um, with any of the, especially with Clinton, um, Obama, and, and even Biden, if I see them come on TV, I change the channel, okay? Because I'm not going to sit there and be lied to, okay? Because every the way you tell if they're lying is their lips are moving, okay? They do nothing but lie. Anyways, don't get me going. Don't get me going. You're going to get me going here. Anyways, this is the Articles of Confederation, Article 4. Um, and I just want to talk about the underlying part. It says... Um, uh, but every state shall always keep up a well-regulated and disciplined militia, sufficiently armed and accoutred, and shall provide and constantly have ready for use in public stores a due number of field pieces and tents and a proper quantity of arms, ammunition, and camp equipage. And uh, so that's in the Articles of Confederation. And then in the Constitution, this is Article 1. Okay, so that's the executive branch. And Article 1, Section 8, Clauses 15 and 16, to provide for the calling forth the militia, to execute the laws of the Union, suppress insurrections, and repel invasions. Well, I'd say we've got an invasion going on right now. Um, to provide for organizing, arming, and disciplining the militia, and for governing such part of them as may be employed in the service of the United States, Rever reserving to the states respectively the appointment of the officers and the authority of training the militia according to the discipline prescribed by Congress. So the states had to appoint the officer and the states would train them. Uh, Congress could make guidelines. And we're going to actually talk about a, uh, there's going to be a, uh, um, an act of the Continental Congress in 1775 that we're going to go through that's really good. And, and it's, it's important. Everybody needs to know this. Um, this is Article 4, Section 4. The Const United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. And um, so the important part to understand here is, is that who decides whether you have a Republican form of government or not? Well, we're going to talk about that. That's right. It is the people. This is uh, Edwin Vieira's Constitutional Homeland Security, Volume 1. So we're going to be talking about Edwin Vieira's books here, okay, both of them. He's got two of them that, that we're talking about. Um, uh, volume 1, Nation and Arms, Chapter 2, Some Fundamental Constitutional Principles of the Militia of the Several States. This is page 44. A duty to keep and bear arms defined the Colonial and State Militia Acts applied only to all able-bodied free males, but never to free women and usually not to male slaves. 
Adult free women, however, were often required by law to provide firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements for their minor sons and their male apprentices and servants enrolled in the militia. So in this limited sense, free women too were subject to the duty to keep arms. And in times of crisis, armed women who organized themselves into their own military companies were not unknown. Kind of like the Amazons in, in mythology, eh? <laughs> they say that women, when they're armed, when they, if they have to go to war, we don't want women to have to go to war because they're very, I think women look at it like they're worried about their children. So they're very vicious women when it, when it comes to this kind of stuff. That's why it's better for guys to do it, I think. That's what they say. I don't know. Um, but women can be very, very vicious when it comes to that kind of stuff. Because, and, and I, I, the way I look at it is probably a mom is protecting her kids. So uh, a lady asked Dr. Franklin, well, doctor, what do we got? A republic or a monarchy? A republic, replied the doctor, if you can keep it. And that's the question, isn't it? If you can keep it. Most people don't know the significance of that. And and in fact, our republic is here, but it's really in abeyance. It's dormant because because we don't have our militias. And, and by the time you're done with this, you'll see why we the people need our militias. Uh, this is Edwin Vieira again, uh, volume one chapter, or it uh, doesn't say what page, um, uh, the, the nation in arms are chapter one, the pressing need to re revitalize the militia of the several states, because tyranny is the exercise of power by the authorities for other than the common good. A Republican form of government must always subordinate what the authorities may imagine as good for themselves and their clients to what is truly good to we the people, for we the people as a whole. And in the final analysis, what is truly good for the people as a whole, only the people themselves can judge because they alone possess the necessary information and can be relied upon to evaluate it from the proper perspective. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? <laughs> we can only decide because we need, it's our perspective that needs to be there. Right. And that's why the they have to conform because there has to be somebody that can do something about it. Right. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Um, I, I don't think they were marijuana growing. They grew hemp. Well, that's true. George Washington was a hemp farmer, but. You know, whatever it was, it was. I, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a cousin to marijuana, but it doesn't have the THC that marijuana has. I suppose. Well, I, they banned hemp too, so. Uh, <laughs> well, but that was in the early 1900s right. that they banned hemp because they couldn't tell the difference between a hemp plant and a marijuana plant. Right. Yeah. But they used to use hemp for rope, you know, all, all sorts. Of, hemp is really good fabric. Right. Right. Well, and there's so many states that are legalizing marijuana too. Well, Anyways, so uh, this is again volume one, page 46. Finally, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. The, the Constitution does not expressly define a Republican form, but it does not and cannot leave that definition to the general government either. To the contrary, the Constitution treats the militia of the several states as perpetual in existence and permanent in authority and character. Therefore, because each of the several states must maintain her own militia, and because every state in this union must be organized, must be guaranteed a republican form of government, 
then simply per force of constitutional logic, a Republican form must encompass a militia in every state. And so, and that's page 46. That's critical. That is. Must. 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 must absolutely. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right to keep them, for the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. That's the Second Amendment. Necessary. This is the only place in the Constitution that the word necessary is used. And think about it. We the people are the state. Okay? In other words, there's Texas State, there's the state of Texas, and then there's the state of Texas in all block capital letters. Texas State is we the people. And same with every other state. Arizona State is we the people in that state. And so, um, but we the people are not stepping up. And if we're going to be free, that's what we got to do. Um, copies of these documents can be found at my website and linked under my recent YouTube videos. This PowerPoint presentation is going to be, uh, I'll upload it to Google Docs, and then um, there will be a copy uh, under my YouTube video in the show notes. There'll be a link where you can download a copy of this PowerPoint presentation as a PDF. Um, the, um, um, the PDF files are smaller because the, the regular PowerPoint file is, is too big. But anyways, um, it'll be as a PDF. Um, so, so anybody that wants a copy of this PowerPoint presentation can get a copy. Um, they're freely available. I'll also put it at some point. It'll be in the free files link on my website. Um, but it won't be yet because it's brand new. I don't get my webmaster to make a lot of changes very often um, just because it's a lot of hassle. Uh, for a complete set of YouTube videos with private information, shares a thumb drive with over 50, 150, actually it's more than a thumb drive. Well, no, it'll be a thumb drive, yep. 150 searchable law dictionaries and other books and forms. Contact me privately at engineerwin at yahoo.com. Donations to support this work are appreciated. I prefer gold or silver coin, but as an extremely less desirable alternative, I can accept the IOUs, the forced loans, the fake money, the securities, okay, you know, Federal Reserve notes are securities. Federal Reserve notes, cryptocurrencies, checks, money orders, etc. Send me an email for particulars. So from now on in this presentation, this is like a 200 slide presentation. So there's a lot of stuff we have to go through. But we're going to be talking about this book. This is the second book in the series, The Sword and the Sovereignty by Edwin Vieira again. Um, Constitutional Homeland Security, Volume 2, The Constitutional Principles of the Militia of the Several States. Um, the Sword and the Sovereignty, he's got four PhDs, um, four degrees, I guess. Maybe it's just four degrees, um, but he's got a PhD. Uh, and he's he's a lawyer, but I, I heard he got this part, and... Um, so uh, I think that that doesn't stop him. He said he's been to the Supreme Court and argued before the Supreme Court. And so I think he still does it. Um, so, you know, the bar is just a bunch of scumbags anyways. Um, anyways, so um, this is page five of the introduction of that book. When the Declaration of Independence announced in the name and by the authority of the good people of the 13 colonies, that governments are instituted among men to secure these unalienable rights and that these united colonies are of right ought to be free and independent states and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all other things, acts and things which independent states may have right do. It asserted with the full and permanent force of law the right of the good people and those who followed them as inhabitants of America to provide by themselves for the security of their own homeland. And when the declaration secured for the good people, the power of sovereigns to provide for their own security through their own government, it envisioned only such security as is fully consistent with the truths the good people held to be self-evident that all men are created equal 
and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and that to secure these rights, governments were instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. So this is there's actually quite a lengthy... Um, um, so this is only the first part. The next slide is, is also is page five and six, okay? So, uh, but this is, this is important. It's talking about the Declaration of Independence. For the good people also emphasize that whenever any system of ostensible security conflicts with these truths, that is, whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, then it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. Therefore, under the Declaration of Independence, no purported security, need for security could ever rationalize contradicting the self-evident truths that justify instituting government in the first place. Furthermore, any scheme of security that rogue public officials might try to impose, which embodied, which embodied such a contradiction, could not be the result of their exercise of just powers. And if carried far enough, as for instance, to the establishment of a paramilitary police state, gee, that sounds like today, would render illegitimate the form of government out of which it arose, and thereupon compel the good people to alter or abolish that form of government in whole or in part. Why they ready home? I'll tell you. Homeland security. Yeah, no joke. Well, they don't have any authority here. Anyways, we the people then ordained and established the Constitution, not just to set up the general government within a federal system. Beyond that, they sought to achieve six specific goals. This is all found in the preamble. To form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. And not for the opposite purpose in any particular. For affirmative words are often in their operation negative of others than those affirmed. And in this case, a negative or exclusive sense must be given to them, for they have no or they have no operation at all. Surely the doing of one thing which is authorized cannot be made the source of an authority to do another which there is no power to do. Moreover, we the people never agreed to sacrifice any one of the preamble's goals in order to supposedly achieve the others either. And then on page 18, so this is all part of the introduction, and page 18, subtitled The Constitutional Principles of the Militia of the Several States. And in page 18 it says, Therefore, Local preparedness and local responses through local organization under local command in the militia of the several states will be necessary. This book is intended to bring that about. Okay, so that's the whole purpose of this book. And that's why I went through all of this stuff, because local preparedness, local responses, local organization under local command in the militia of the several states is necessary. Now, I've got a question for you. What's would that? You, would you notify the sheriff's department about the militia in the county or just have it done? I would, I would actually try and get his support. You know, I would tell him this is what we're going to do. Um, and I would research all the state codes and stuff about it first. And then I'd, I'd ask him, I'd tell him, we don't want your financial support, but any, any advice you can give us. Uh, that would help us to set it up in a way that uh, would help you, uh, we would be, we would certainly consider. You see what I'm saying? And, and that kind of thing. And, and, and we want you to know that we're here and, and that we can come to your aid if, if called upon. But he has a duty to preserve the militia to make sure it's... Well, actually, if you read this book, it says in there that, that the militia is not subject to the county sheriff. Yeah. So that's that's really powerful. I don't have that in this book here, in this in this presentation, but I'm glad you brought that up because it does say in the book that the militia is not subject to the county sheriff. So who defines what the militia is? We the people do. So if I just create a group and say I'm a militia, it can't. I mean, I'm not subject to the county sheriff. No, you're not. As 
but 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 you have to understand that that you go back to the old colonial days and 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 I think that that um, we could we could base it on on um, 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 these old acts of Congress. There's some old acts and 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 how they did it. And um, and as long as we and then you, you'd want to look in whatever state statutes and stuff like that that, that might cover it. And that's why we would probably want to talk to the county sheriff and make sure that uh, if there's anything we're missing, um, uh, just because of the fact that we don't want them to think that we're the enemy. OK. Right. And, and we're yeah, we're here and we're exercising our constitutional rights. And, and and we want to support you in doing your lawful duty, okay? Lawful duty, okay? And I talk about this further on, okay? So we're going to talk about that. But but um, but we all need some government. We need our lawful government, our constitutional government. And 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 I think that and I talk about it further on. I think that there'd be many of our public servants would be very glad that we're giving them an excuse to honor their oath. Yeah, and then also get with the veterans. They yes, try to, they try yes, to get involved. That, yeah. yes, yes. Absolutely. Um, okay, so, and and Edwin Vieira wrote this book, Reluctant Preppers. Obviously, that's in pursuant of, of, his, of what this book is designed, um, is to, again... Local preparedness, local responses through local organization under local command in the militia of the several states will be necessary. And so this is another one of his books that he wrote, Reluctant Preppers. And this is actually News with Views and edwinviera.com. You can contact him that way. I would suggest, you know, that um, uh, Joe actually had, had a CD with this on it. And I'm taking the stuff from that. And so, uh, but... Um, and I don't know if you can even buy this anymore, except you might be able to get it from him. Um, I think Joe bought a CD with it on it, and, and he probably got it from him, but I'm not sure. Joe um, uh, is the one that introduced me to this guy, and, and, and it's, it's brilliant, I'm telling you. This guy is, I mean, he's got a PhD, so that, that gives him some credit there, but it's very, very thoroughly, very well done. Um, never forget... The men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tracks evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. And think about it, that's what they did. They went out and they engaged the British. <laughs> Talk about balls. <laughs> so, chapter one, which is on page 21, I'm just gonna, most of these chapters, I'm just gonna talk about the subtitle because, because there's, it's, this book is 2,000 pages. So there's no way that I can cover, give it justice. Uh, I'm just trying to cover some of the stuff and, and some bullet points to, so we can understand. And, and I would encourage people to get a copy of this book and, um, and um, maybe he would write a sequel to it or something. I don't know. Anyways, the constitutional principles of the militia of the several states must be derived from pre-constitutional militia statutes of the American colonies and independent states. And there's some some quotes from Supreme Court justices, and even recently there's a quote from uh, Thomas. I don't even have that in here, but Clarence Thomas in a case about a year ago said the same thing, is that if you want to interpret what the Constitution says, you got to go back to the times when it was written. And um, this is chapter 1 on page 22. It is perverse to pretend, as some will persist in doing, that the Declaration of Independence is not the original and still fully enforceable supreme organic law of each of the several states and of the United States as a whole. For if the Declaration were not such, that neither we, the people, nor any of the states individually, nor the United States collectively, could have claimed since 1776 or can claim today an independent sovereignty on the base of which to enact any other laws, such as the state's constitutions, the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution of the United States, and all the statutes made in pursuance thereof. Yet plainly the Declaration established not only when an individual living in pre-constitutional era 
became an American citizen, independent of Britain as a matter of law as well as fact, but also when all American citizens in their collective political capacities as the good people of these colonies became independent sovereigns, no less as a matter of law, okay? So he talks about we the people being sovereign. Cold Pepper Minutemen. This is uh, one of the flags I got online. Culpeper County, Virginia, I guess, was established in 1749. But this is the Minutemen, is, when that got established, was in 1775. And we'll go through the Act of Congress that passed that they passed that established the Minutemen. We established the first militias, and it's, it's pretty good. Um, I mean, this is all stuff that we could use to organize our own militias. Vieira goes on, this is me, Vieira goes on to explain that the well-regulated militia talked about in the Constitution can only mean what it meant when the Constitution was written, when everybody was required to be armed as required by colonial laws and common law. This is uh, Associate Justice Horace Gray on page 85, chapter 1, part 2, The Evidence. Um... Associate Justice, I'm guessing Associate Justice, Supreme Court. In construing any act of legislation, whether a statute enacted by the legislature or a constitution established by the people as the supreme law of the land, regard is to be had not only to all the parts of the act itself and of any former act of the same lawmaking power of which the act in question is an amendment, but also to the condition, to the history of the law as previously existing and in the light of which the new act must be read and interpreted. So again, we have to interpret the Second Amendment as in how what the circumstances that brought about the Constitution and everything else. And so never forget, the men who started this country were marijuana-growing, whiskey-drinking, tax-evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. So this is some of the acts Okay, what he does is he goes through the Rhode Island Acts and the Virginia Acts as to give you an idea on what kind of acts they were passing pre uh, in colonial days. Okay, so this one starts in 1699, and um, and we're going to go into some of the some of the stuff in these acts because it's pretty interesting. Um, so this is just the titles of the acts, but um, but uh, so then. There was uh, in 1609, 1701, and 1705 an act for the better regulating the militia for punishing offenders as shall not conform to the law re thereunto relating. 1718, 1730, 1744 an act for repealing several laws relating to the militia within this colony and for further regulating of the same. 1726 an act for regulating the militia and the election of the officers of each respective company in this colony. 1730 no. No constraint shall be laid upon the conscience of any person whatsoever by force of any law, act or law for the keeping up or regulating the militia within this county. There was uh, Quakers. There was people who had a religious objection, and they're basically saying that we're not going to force people that have a religious objection to participate in the militia. Um, 1755, petitioners seeking a charter for an independent company proposed the laws of the colony made for regulating the militia for the rule of their conduct. 1755, an act in addition to several acts relating to the militia of this colony. 1756, an act in addition to an amendment of the several acts regulating the militia. 1766, an act regulating the militia in this colony. 1774, an act in addition to an amendment to an act entitled an act regulating the militia of this colony. 1779, whereas the security and defense of all free states essentially depend under God upon the exertions of a well-regulated militia. Wherefore, for the better forming, regulating, and conducting a military force in the state being enacted, an act for the better forming, regulating, and conducting the military force of the state. So that's Rhode Island. And then this is Virginia. And Virginia goes back to 1723. Whereas a due regulation of the militia is absolutely necessary for the defense of this country, an 
Act for the Settling and Better Regulation of the Militia, 1738. An Act for the Better Regulation of the Militia, 1754. An Act for Amending. An Act entitled An Act for Better Regulation of the Militia, 1755. An Act for Better Regulation and Training the Militia, 1757. An Act for the Better Regulating and Disciplining the Militia. 1759, an act for continuing an act entitled an act for the better regulating and disciplining the militia. 1762, an act for amending and further continuing the act for the better regulating and disciplining the militia. 1766, uh, an act to continue and amend the act for better regulating and disciplining the militia. So, you know, I guess I don't need to read all of these, but the point is, is there's numerous acts regulating the militia throughout the colonial periods. And uh, we're gonna go into what some of these acts require, okay, because it's pretty interesting. This is chapter three, page 95, subtitled, Rhode Island founded uh, her pre-constitutional militia on society's right of self-preservation and laws of nature and nature's God. Uh, that phrase is taken from Black Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. Uh, just if anybody doesn't know who Blackstone was, Blackstone was an English jurist, a judge, who was on the equivalent of the Supreme Court and fell out of, out of favor with the king. And he uh, went into politics and, and, and was responsible. There's a Civil Rights Act in England, and he was responsible for some other stuff. But so, and he wrote a set of books called Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England. And that phrase is taken from that. He wrote the set of books in in the 1760s, I think. Anyways, from Rhode Island's very beginning, provision for her homeland security was the legal duty of every able-bodied adult free male. The immediate and especially the ultimate sources of this duty were never in doubt. Uh, this is Rhode Island's charter, okay, part of it. The colony's first constitution, the charter of 1663 by King Charles II, um, gave and granted unto the governor and company of the colony that it shall and may be lawful to and for said governor to nominate, appoint, and constitute such as many commanders, governors, and military officers as to them shall seem requisite for the leading, conducting, and training of the inhabitants of said plantation and martial affairs and for the defense and safeguard of said plantations, and that it shall be and shall and may be lawful to and for all and every commander, governor, military officers, and major part of the freemen of said company to assemble, exercise in arms, martial array, and put in warlike posture the inhabitants of said colony for their special defense and safety, and to lead and conduct the said inhabitants and to encounter, impulse, expel, and resist by force of arms as well by sea and by land and also to kill, slay and destroy by all fitting ways, enterprises and means whatsoever all and every such person or persons as shall at any time hereafter attempt or enterprise the destruction, invasion, detriment or annoyance of said inhabitants or plantations. So that's talking about the militia. <laughs> This is uh, chapter four, page 99, subtitled Rhode Island's pre-constitutional militia was an institution of popular self-government, not in any sense a private establishment. Uh, Rhode Island organized her pre-constitutional militia on the principle of near universal compulsory service by every adult, able-bodied free male. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Rhode Island, this is chapter six, page 137. Rhode Island required essentially all of the able-bodied adult free male within her territory to be personally equipped with their very own firearms, ammunition, and necessary accoutrements suitable for the, suitable for the defense of their community as a whole and of themselves as individuals. Chapter 7, page 169, subtitled Rhode Island aimed at having her pre-constitutional militia provided with the types of firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements that were equivalent to the standard equipment employed in the regular armed forces of that day. So the idea that we're not allowed to have machine guns, it's a bunch of crap. 
Rhode Island, subtitled chapter 8, page 175, Rhode Island provided for regular inspections in order to ensure that her inhabitants possessed all of the requisite firearms and ammunition in serviceable condition. So they would say, well, let's see your gun, uh, your arm. And, and, and if it wasn't working, then you could go get it fixed. They'd fix it for you and get it working. And, um, but you had to have it. Okay. And there is fines. So and we're going to talk about that. Uh, chapter 9, page 8, 181. This is the subtitle again, I think. Um, I forgot to put it in here, but I think it's a subtitle. Throughout the pre-constitutional era, Rhode Island's militia statutes presupposed, promoted, protected, and relied upon a free market in firearms and ammunition. Chapter 10, page 197. Rhode Island required all of her resident able-bodied free males between 16 and 60 years of age to participate in some specifically mandated manner in her pre-constitutional militia. Chapter 12, page 275. So I didn't include all the chapters here. See, I think that last one was chapter 10. This is chapter 12. Um, subtitled, Rhode Island enforced in her pre-constitutional militia statutes by imposing fines and other penalties for each individual's every infraction. And this is... Page 275, again, on the same page, this is some of the statutes. Uh, in 1639, 1639, no man shall go two miles from town unarmed, either with gun or sword, and none shall come to any public meeting without his weapon. Upon the default of either, he shall forfeit five shillings. <laughs> 1639, Mr. Easton, for breach of an order, is coming to the public meeting without his weapon is to pay five shillings. 1648, several times in the year, the ban shall openly in the field be exercised, and there shall be two general musters in the year, and if any shall fail to make their personal appearance, he shall forfeit and pay five shillings, and if any person shall come to training or general muster defective in his arms or furniture equivalent, he shall pay 12 pence. So, so they had to, I mean, that was, they, they, everybody was mandatory. Um, chapter 13, page 297, Rhode Island's pre-constitutional militia statutes embodied the antithesis of modern gun control. Ain't that the truth? You know, you're, you're required to go to public meetings with your arms. Well, now they make you, they want to make sure you're unarmed when you go into the courthouse. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's, it's changed big time. And it's, it's, uh, Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left the nights, left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. They engaged the British is what they did. And, and I think that that's what started the War of Independence because the governors, they were all doing what the British wanted them to do. And, and the people stood up and said, screw you. Chapter 26. So there's a bunch of chapters that are missed. So it goes chapter 13 to chapter 26. So I, there's a bunch of them that are missed. And so the resolution, those, those, those chapters were probably Virginia, summarizing Virginia stuff, which is similar to Rhode Island. Anyways, uh, the resolution of the Continental Congress of 18 July 1775 provides an excellent summer, summary of the major principles of the militia of the several states as the founding fathers understood them from their own personal experience. Um, so this is the act of 1775, um, resolved that it be recommended to the inhabitants of all United English colonies in North America, that all able-bodied effective men between 16 and 50 years of age in each colony immediately form themselves into regular companies of militia to consist of one captain, two lieutenants, one ensign, four sergeants, four corporals, one clerk, one drummer, one fifer, and about 68 privates that the officers of each company shall be chosen by the respective companies, that each soldier shall be furnished with a good musket that will carry an ounce ball and a bayonet, steel ramrod, worm, uh, writing wire, and a brush fitted thereto, a cutting sword or tomahawk. I'd like to have a tomahawk. And a cartridge box that will contain 23 rounds of cartridges, 12 flints, and a knapsack and uh, that the companies be formed into regiments or battalions officered with a colonel, lieutenant colonel, two majors, an adjutant, adjutant and quartermaster. Um, 
And it goes on that all officers of the, above the rank of captain be appointed by their respective uh, provincial assemblies or conventions or in their recess by the committees of safety appointed by assemblies or conventions. That all officers be commissioned by the provincial assemblies or conventions or in their recess by the committees of safety appointed by the uh, assemblies or conventions. I was wondering if that was redundant, but it's not. That all the militia take proper care to acquire military skill and be well prepared for defense by being each man provided with one pound of good gunpowder and four pounds of ball fitted to his gun. And one fourth part of the militia in every county be selected for Minutemen. A quarter of them were Minutemen. This is where the Minutemen come from. One fourth part of the militia in every county be selected for Minutemen of such persons as are willing to enter into this necessary service formed into companies and battalions and their officers chosen and commissioned as aforesaid and be ready on the shortest notice to march to any place where their assistance may be required for the defense of their own or a neighboring colony. And in these Minutemen may eventually be called to action before the whole body of the militia are sufficiently trained. It is recommended that a more particular and diligent attention be paid to their instruction and military discipline. That such of the Minutemen as desire it may be, uh, it be relieved of, by their drafts as aforesaid for the whole body of the militia once in four months. In other words, they can, if they didn't want to do it anymore in four months, they could um, step down. As there are some people who from religious principles cannot bear arms in any case, this Congress intend no violence to their conscience, but earnestly recommend to them to contribute liberally in this time of universal calamity to the relief of their distressed uh, brethren in the several colonies and to do all other services as their oppressed country, which they can consistently with their religious, which they can consistently with their religious principles. In other words, the Quakers might not be able to uh, have arms, but maybe they can cook meals for the soldiers or something like that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, the Amish, sure, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a quarter of them. Minutemen to be go on a bonus. That's why they're called Minutemen. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> then it be recommended to the assemblies or conventions in the respective colonies to provide as soon as possible sufficient stores ammunition for their colonies, uh, and that they devise proper means of furnishing with arms such effective men as are poor and unable to furnish themselves. So people that couldn't afford it, you know, there was ways of. Uh, and, and maybe that's a way that the Quakers or somebody could help out the people that couldn't afford it. Uh, be it remembered to each colony to appoint a committee of safety to superintend and direct all matters necessary for the security and defense of their respective colonies in the recess of their assemblies and conventions. So they had committees of safety. I think we've all heard about the committees of safety. That each colony at their own expense, make such provision by armed vessels or otherwise as their respective assemblies, conventions, or committees of safety shall judge expedient and suitable to their circumstances and situations for the protection of their harbors and navigation of their sea coasts against all unlawful invasions, attacks, and depredations from cutters and ships of war. That it be recommended to the makers of arms for the use of the militia that they make good substantial muskets with barrels three three feet and a half in length that will carry an ounce ball and fitted with a good bayonet and steel ramrod that, and that the making such arms be encouraged in these united colonies. Where in any colony a militia is already formed under regulations approved of by the convention of such colony or by such assemblies as are annually elective, we uh, refer to the discretion of such convention or assembly either to adopt the foregoing regulations in the whole or in part or to continue their former as they may on consideration of all circumstances shall think best. In other words, this is a recommendation. And, and if you have stuff that is already outlining this stuff, you, you can use that or you can use this. Oh yeah, absolutely. This is uh, conclusions, part three conclusions, page 775. Uh, a quote by Andrew Fletcher, I'm not sure who that was, maybe one of the founding fathers, 
a good militias of such importance to a nation that it is the chief part of the constitution of any free government. For though, as do other things, the constitution never be so slight, a good militia will always preserve the public liberty. But in the best constitution that ever was, as to all other parts of government, if the militia be not upon the right foot, the liberty of that people must perish. In other words, if you don't have a militia, and that's what we have right now as a police state, and, uh, and that's because we don't have a militia. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. They went and engaged the British is what they did. Chapter 27. The pre-constitutional militia statutes in the colonies and independent states establish uh, at least 17 fundamental principles that define the constitutional structure and service of revitalized militia of the several states. So there's 17 principles, and we'll go through those principles. The militia of the several states upon, are based upon each person's individually and especially the community's collective rights, powers, privileges, immunities, and duties of self-defense under the laws of nature and nature's God. We're going to see that quote here. That's taken from Blackstone's commentaries, and we're going to talk about that too. Each of the militia of the several states must always be identified as the militia of a particular state, and by no other name. The militia of the several states must always be strictly differentiated from the regular army and navy of the United States, from the troops and ships of war. Okay, so you're not troops um, that that the states may keep in how time of. There you go. In time of peace, with the consent of Congress, the militia of the several states are governmental governmental establishments, not private institutions. Okay, it's we the people. Okay, we the people are the state. The militia of the several states perform the critically important political function of enforcing popular sovereignty both in ordinary and especially in extraordinary times. The militia of the several states consists of separate and independent establishments which must always exist in each and every state throughout the United States. Congress, the states, and in default thereof, we the people themselves must ensure that each and every one of the militia of the several states is fully organized, armed, disciplined, and trained at all times. Near universal membership, compulsory participation, and reasonable equality in individuals' burdens of service are necessary characteristics of the militia of the several states. Service in each uh, of the militia of the several states is subject only to limited exemptions all of which in principle must be consistent with the fundamental standards of a well-regulated militia and in application must advance the common defense and the general welfare. Remember those phrases are taken from the preamble. Because the ultimate goal of homeland security must be we the people's own political freedom and economic well-being and because that goal can be attained only by the people's own participation where the people actually reside in local communities, the militia of the several states must be organized and controlled from the bottom up, not from the top down. Unless specifically exempted, all members of the militia of the several states must acquire thereafter at all times must maintain and must be supported by public officials in their maintenance of personal possession and usually their own private ownership of firearms, ammunition, accoutrements suitable for their militia service. Now, I heard that Johnson, remember after Kennedy was assassinated, President Johnson, prior to President Johnson, they used to, the U.S. government used to issue ammunition for people, for people. For people. Right. Yeah, well, and a rifle, that's true. But, and so what I heard is they used to issue ammunition and people, so people could go and practice in support of the militias. And I know for a fact that they used to issue a rifle because I remember back in the 90s when they stopped doing it under the Bush administration. And, and, uh, and it was announced because they used to issue a 303. And, 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 uh, and you could go and get one for free from the government 
in support of the militia. Anyways, yeah, well, that's the best ones because uh, because your accuracy is way better. Anyways, um, so every individual possibly eligible to be a member of the militia of the several states may acquire, possess, and own as a right any firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements suitable for, suitable for any type of militia service. Every individual possibly eligible for service in the militia of the several states must enjoy untrammeled access to a free market in which to obtain whatever firearms, ammunition, and accoutrements may prove useful for any type of militia service. So, Lynn, did, did you see that thing about uh, them stopping exports from all the uh, arms manufacturers just recently? Executive order? Yeah. 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 No, I didn't. So they can't export arms. Yes. Well, that's good. We need them here. Well, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> well, but the downside is, you know, if you take away arms manufacturing, you you literally hamstring America, hamstring America because that's the only thing we still make here is, is what, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Arms and weapons of mass destruction. That's true. I don't. I don't know the particulars of what exactly they limited to be exported. I know that there's. When I do aerospace engineering consulting, they have a. Uh, it's called um, trafficking in arms regulations. Um, T. There's an acronym. It's called trafficking in arms regulations, and it's anything that can be used in arms. And so they have a bunch of regulations, and so they might have tightened those up. Um, because we still, you know, send out F-16s and stuff like that. Uh, but so anyways. Yeah, we also leave weapons in Afghanistan too. Oh, and yeah. Furious, we gave the yeah. Mexico. What a bunch of, yeah. yeah, don't get me going. You're okay. going to get me going. Okay, I'll get those quick. <laughs> so then to continue on, every member of the militia of the several states must be trained to participate in the provision of some aspect of homeland security for his particular state and locality, as well as for the United States as a whole. The militia of the several states are vested with the constitutional authority and responsibility to, and therefore must, provide every type of protection, whether political, economic, or social in character, that may be necessary to the security of a free state in every state for the United States as a whole, and ultimately for we the people under whatever form of government they may establish. A primary method for enforcing discipline as well as raising revenue uh, within revitalized militia of the several states should be the imposition of fines for their members' failures, neglects, or refusals to perform their duties. You know, and maybe some guy's rich and he doesn't feel like going out to the mustard, so he just chips in some money for them, eh? <laughs> What's wrong with that, you know? And uh, and uh, so anyways, uh, under present uh, conditions, raising independent colonies composed of volunteers on a local basis provides the best means to be be begin revitalization of the militia of the several states. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. So you're starting to get the idea, eh? <laughs> the militia, this is chapter 28, the militia of the several states are based upon each person's individual and especially the community's collective rights, powers, privileges, immunities, duties of self-defense under the law of nature and nature's God. And that's taken from Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. And this is, this is talking about it here, Blackstone's commentaries. I didn't, it doesn't say what book, because Blackstone actually wrote a series of four books, and um, and then what page it's on, it doesn't say. But there's a extensive bibliography in the back of this book, and so it could be in there. I just didn't, uh, I just didn't uh, put it in there. At any rate, um, the defense of oneself or the mutual and reciprocal defense of such as stand in the relations of husband and wife parent and child, master and servant. In these cases, if the party himself or any of these, his relations be forcibly attacked in his person or property, it is lawful for him to repel, repel force by force. And the breach of the peace, which happens, 
is chargeable upon him only who began the affray. For the law, in this case, respects the passions of human mind, and when external violence is offered to a man himself or those whom he bears a near connection, makes it lawful in him to do himself that immediate justice to which he is prompted by nature, and which no prudential motives are strong enough to restrain. It considers that the future process of law is by no means an adequate remedy for injuries accompanied with force, since it is impossible to say to what wanton lengths of rapine or cruelty outrages of this sort might be carried unless it were permitted a man immediately to oppose violence with another. Self-defense, therefore, as it is justly called by the primary laws of nature, so it is not, neither can it be in fact taken away by the law of society. So there's a law of society and there's a law of self-defense. And so what he's saying is that we have the right to self-defense and just because we organize ourselves in communities, doesn't mean we lose that right to self-defense. We still have the right to self-defense. And that's taken from Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England. Um, so chapter 28, page, so this, I think this is uh, for, from this Americans in that time naturally, page 762. Yeah, so that's 761, this is the next page. From this, Americans in that time naturally drew several important conclusions directly applicable to their militia. Okay, so these are some conclusions that were taken from that Blackstone's commentaries, as well as what John Locke had said and everything else. Okay, first, that self-defense is the ultimate law of society because it is the primary law of nature. Second, that self-defense is an unconditional right privilege and immunity because it is not neither can it be in fact taken away by the law of society as such self-defense comes within unalienable rights with which all men are endowed by their creator third that each and every individual as a beneficiary of an unconditional right privilege and immunity superior to the law of society requires no permission from any public official or anyone else for that matter to engage in self-defense. It gets better. <laughs> Fourth, that is an unconditional and unalienable right. Self-defense is entitled to receive support from public officials, exercise of whatever governmental powers may prove to be necessary and proper to provide for its full recognition, implementation and effectuation through the law of society, for as the declaration asserted, it is to secure these rights that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Fifth, that the full recognition, implementation, and effectuation of the right of self-defense requires extrapolation from the familial to the social level of Blackstone's teaching that every man is entitled to defend not only himself but also those to whom he bears a near connection, so that the right of self-defense is understood clearly and applied completely in both of its aspects, namely the individual or personal, and especially the collective or political. In other words, if I see somebody beating up Karen, I'm gonna step in there and I have that right. You have that duty, we have that duty. That duty, society. exactly. Exactly. Sixth, that the exclusive purpose of and justification for self-defense, individual or collective, are of that term itself imports. Always defense, never aggression, okay? In other words, the stuff about Iraq and all the rest of that crap, that's a bunch of crap. We have no business going overseas. Right. Chapter 29. Page 769, each of the militia of the several states must always be identified as the militia of a particular state and by no other name. Chapter 30, page 773, the militia of the several states must always be strictly differentiated 
from the regular Army and Navy of the United States and from the troops or ships of war, and that the states may keep in time of peace with the consent of Congress. So the militia has nothing to do with any consent from Congress. We're not troops. We're nothing that has anything to do with that. Chapter 32, page 881. The militia of the several states perform a critically important political function of enforcing we the people's sovereignty, both in ordinary and especially in extraordinary times. We the people's sovereignty. That's important, and we're going to see something about that real soon. Chapter 33, page 913, subtitled The Militia of the Several States, consists of separate and independent establishments which must always exist in each and every state throughout the United States. Chapter 33, this is page 913, so that's on this page. Um, in the nature of things, the militia must be permanently in existence, thoroughly organized, and prepared at all times by dint of equipment and training to perform their functions. Because one, a fundamental axiom of political philosophy is that sovereignty is never in abeyance. Okay? Two, in America, we the people are the sovereigns. Three, sovereignty is the highest form of political power, and sovereigns are the supreme executors of that power. Four, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Five, through their militia, the people hold the guns and therefore maintain control over the ultimate political power in their own hands. Six, to the degree that the people do not hold the guns in their own hands, they forfeit political power. Seven, once the people have forfeited enough political power, popular sovereignty will be in abeyance. That's what we're happening nowadays because we're not organizing our militias. And in which case, some other sovereign will inevitably assert its dominance over society. District of Columbia, Congress. Eight, inasmuch as a well-regulated militia is necessary to the security of a free state and the only political reliable group in a free state consists of the people themselves, this new sovereign from which political power grows out of the barrel of guns other than those held by the militia will be the tool of factions and other special interests inimical to a free society. But gee, that looks like what's going on right now. Yeah, the anti-gunner is... Absolutely. In That's that's not that's not that's right, that's not. Um, never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Chapter forty five, page twelve ninety five. The Second Amendment explains the purpose of and renders absolute the position the position of the militia of the several states in the Constitution's federal system, and we the people's right to be organized, armed, disciplined, and trained for militia service. Dwight D. Eisenhower, Part 4, Forebodings, page 1539. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. And that's Eisenhower. That's pretty Yeah. Chapter 47, page 1541. Unless the militia of the several states are revitalized in the immediate future, America will devolve into a national paramilitary police state dominated by a standing army and a military industrial complex. 
And that's exactly what's going on now. And, absolutely. And they're paramilitary police. That's what it says right there. And they're all D.C. Chapter 48, page 1647. Outside of a zone of actual military combat operations, the only form of martial law applicable to civilians, which is constitutionally allowable within America, arises from the militia of the several states, are called for it to execute the laws of the Union or the laws of their states. Chapter 49, page 1689. In order to function as effective checks and balances against standing armies, the military industrial complex and a domestic national paramilitary police state, members of the militia of the several states must be immune from the wholesale impressment into the regular armed forces. That's I never thought of that, but that's true. I mean, they can't be drafted. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So if you're part of the militia, that's an excuse to get out of it, I think, if you want it. Right. Uh, conclusion, page 1888. Extreme economic, political, and social dislocations and conflicts throughout America will inevitably result if the militia of the several states are not revitalized in the near future. And I think he's nailing it, and it's happening. We're watching it happen. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana-growing, whiskey-drinking, tax-evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Think about it. They went and engaged the British. We are currently in a police state. Military police are everywhere. The military police with the military so-called courts and their foreign agents of the Roman cult bar members are populating our prisons with their tyranny. If we were forming our state militias, our militia of our state, things would be radically different, I think. Posse comitatus, the power and force of the county, the entire population of the county above the age of 15, which a sheriff may summon, to his assistance in certain cases as to aid him in keeping the peace and pursuing and arresting felons. Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death after witnessing a man flogged to death for refusing to take a license. By the police. Yeah. The corrupt Star Chamber Courts of England required defendants to have a liar. Well, I meant counsel. No, I meant a liar. Char Star Chamber stood for swiftness, arbitrary power. It was a limitation on the common law. Nothing about Star Chamber. A lot of people don't know what that means. Well, it's basically that's the so-called courts. That's what this this Supreme Court case says it right here. They force you to get a lawyer. Anyways, this is two years. Two years. George the Third, Chapter 12, 1778. Two years after the Declaration of Independence, it's kind of like closing a barn door after the horses get out. Whereas taxation by the Parliament of Great Britain for the purpose of raising a revenue in His Majesty's colonies, provinces, and plantations in North America has been found by experience to great, occasion great uneasiness and disorders. Well, no shit, that man, that from and after the passing of this act, the King and Parliament of Great Britain will not impose any duty, tax, or assessment, whatever, payable in any of the colonies, provinces, or plantations in North America or the West Indies except only such duties as it may be expedient to impose for the regulation of commerce. There's three kinds of martial law. This is taken from a case ex parte Milligan. It's a Civil War era case. Um, full martial law, declaration of martial law is issued, put, troops put on the street, used only during wartime, used in a foreign country, or when actually invaded by a foreign power to put down an armed rebellion. Martial law proper is the law of the armed forces. When a captain tells a private what to do, it's enforced by court martial. Martial law rule is the law of necessity and emergency. It allows the domestic use of martial law powers used during peace times. That's what you see going on right now. It's all these military police. It's martial law rule. This is the Lieber Code article uh, prepared by Francis Lieber. Um, promulgated as General Orders 100 by President Lincoln, 24th of April, 1863. Francis Lieber was a Harvard Law Professor. Char Article 1, a place, district, or country occupied by an enemy stands in consequence of the occupation under the martial law of the invading or occupying army, whether any proclamation declaring martial law or any public warning to the inhabitants has been issued or not. Martial law is the immediate and direct effect and consequence of occupation or conquest. The presence of a hostile army proclaims its martial law. Article 2. 
Martial law doesn't cease of, during the hostile occupation except by special proclamation ordered by the commander in chief or by special mention in the treaty of peace concluding the war. So there's, I've never seen any proclamations and, and, and there has been, I've seen treaty of peace like the Treaty of Hidalgo uh, covers Arizona, California, Nevada, half of New Mexico. Uh, anyways, <laughs> but in there it doesn't say anything about ending the martial law. Martial law in a hostile country consists in the suspension by the occupying military authority of the criminal and civil law and of the domestic administration and government in the occupied place or territory and in the substitution of military rule and force for the same as well as in the dictation of general laws as far as military necessity requires the suspension, substitution, and, or dictation. The commander of the forces may proclaim that the administration of all civil and penal law shall continue either wholly or in part as in times of peace unless other, or otherwise ordered by the military authority. This is Article 3 of the Libra Code and dictation. That's, that's dictatorship. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, check out my other videos. Uh, these are on YouTube, as long as YouTube doesn't take my channel down. They've tried to take it down twice, but it's up. Thanks to these playlists, Roman cult playlists, bankrupt corporate so-called governments, bar members one through eight. Do it yourself how not to volunteer for the selective service in the draft. Martial law is here. Actually, I don't do another one about do it yourself how not to volunteer for the selective service in the draft because... Uh, if they're in the militia, that's an excuse to get out of the draft. Anyways, martial law is here. Do yourself no income tax. Do yourself free mail. Uh, do yourself kangaroo courts. Canada Border Pigs playlist. Bar members and their satanic connections playlist. So necessity is the plea of every infringement of human freedom. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. Never forget the men who started this country are marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the pigs. <laughs> Dr. Edwin Vieira su suggests that we the people can and should organize our own militia. You need to research your state statutes and make sure your militia is not violating any of your state codes. But there's, in Texas, I can tell you there's next to nothing. Um, the United States Department of Homeland Security is a subsidiary of the Secret Service, which is owned by the Treasury, which is the International Monetary Fund. Why would you do a lawsuit against the state of Texas if they had to make sure they were This is Edwin Vieira's book, the first book, Homeland Security. Uh, that's, a, that's him on the back cover. Um, and then he also wrote another book about him, how to dethrone the imperial judiciary. And uh, that sounds like it'd probably be a good book. I did a FOIA request to the uh, Homeland Security pigs. And um, this is what came back. The point I want to make here is that Secret Service, Homeland Security is a subsidiary of the Secret Service. That's what they're saying right there on that heading. Um the United States has not had a treasury since 1921. Look it up. 41 stat, uh, page 654. The United States Department of the Treasury is now the International Monetary Fund. Presidential Documents, volume 29, page number 4, page 113. And also 22 U.S. Code 285 to 288. And the International Monetary Fund is a subsidiary of the World Bank. And that 22 U.S. Code 285 to 288, actually that's 22, Code of Law for the District of Columbia, 285 to 288. Department of Homeland Security and all its subsidiaries, TSA, FEMA, Customs, Immigration, are subsidiaries of the United States Secret Service. The United States Secret Service is a, is a subsidiary of the Treasury Department. The Treasury is the International Monetary Fund. The Internal Revenue Service is an agency of the International Monetary Fund. That's found in diversified metal products versus IRS. Um, and it's also found at Public Law 94-564, Senate Report 94-1148, and Reorganization Plan Number 26, Public Law 102-391. And this is the uh, Secret Service. Okay, so the Secret Service's own was formerly the uh, Nazi SS. 
It's uh, Nazi SS, Knights of the Secetus Secorum. It's uh, Knights of the Holy See, Archbishop Cardinal Patelli, Superior General. It's all from the Roman cult. The Nazi SS, known as the SS, a shortened name for the Knights of the Holy See, is a Roman Catholic spiritual and military order first formed in 1933, based completely upon the Jesuit order structure upon signing the Sacred Reich Concordat. Okay, that's the Concordat of 1933 that Hitler signed with the Vatican, specifically through the application of Articles 1, 12, 15, 21, and 33, with the enaction of Clause C of the Secret Supplement of the Concordat between Franz von Papen on behalf of Nazi Germany and Cardinal Eugenio Patelli, Pope Pius the Seventh. Anyways, it's always hidden somewhere. They're yep. They're always involved. The United Nations, through the International Monetary Fund, issues Social Security numbers. The Department of the Treasury issues the SS5, uh, uh, not the Social Security Administration. The new SS5 forms do not state who or what publishes them. The early SS5 forms state that they are Department of Treasury forms. All Social Security checks come directly from the International Monetary Fund in the UN, and it says on the front of the check. Isn't it amazing? And it is amazing how these terror alerts start coming out when there's DHS funding bills before Congress. Some people are saying that the United Nations is going to invade. It's already happened. These United Nations pigs are already here and have been for decades. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot the cops. The only homeland security are the terrorists. The U.S. the only jurist the uh, only have jurisdiction in the District of Columbia. They're busy bringing illegals across the border to manipulate the elections, and who knows what else? There's I think they're bringing an army across the border. They're busy creating terrorists so they can shed innocent blood for their Roman cult god Baal. They're making business for themselves. If we want homeland security, we need to form our own militias and create our own homeland security. Homeland security are the terrorists. When did these guys become these guys? The only, the only thing they're missing in that new picture is, is the full sleeve of you know, demonic tattoos all over. Yeah, no joke. Eh? You know? I, I mean, if you look at the police today, compared to like... I know. Yeah. You, you would think that you would think that these cops with all their you know prison tattoos and satanic tattoos all over them were you know escaped convicts that actually murdered a police officer and, and took their took their uniform. Well, they get. I mean, you know, nobody 15 years ago would go with a police officer today. Do they go? This guy can't be a police officer. You know, look at this guy. Like, I mean, he's clearly a common thug. Yeah. You know, and yeah. That's right. When did this become this? And then we told them that the spying is supposed to keep them safe. Ah! <laughs> yeah. If you want total security, go to prison. There you're fed, clothed, given medical care, and so on. The only thing lacking is freedom. That awkward moment when you realize the same government that's supposed to protect us from terrorists is the terrorist. Yeah. Can you spot the terrorists? Terrorism is a noun, use of violence and intimidation in the pursuit of political aims. I see a whole bunch of terrorists right there. Terrorism, a system of government that seeks to rule by intimidation. Those who think that a police state could never happen to, to America, wake up. Do you feel safe? Wake up and smell the bondage. Never forget. <laughs> The men who started the country were marijuana-growing, whiskey-drinking, tax-evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot the cops. If we can't rape you, the terrorists win. TSA choice, molestation or radiation. Love the TSA Batty Comedy Explorer Corps. We're here for you. Think of us as your physician, your health and safety are our concern. TSA cavity searches coming sooner than you think because profiling would offend the terrorists. Keep telling yourself that you're free. 
Warning, this is the standing army you're told not to tolerate. If you think this is for your protection, you clearly have no idea what's going on. Literally. Pull over your taillights out. Yeah. In Texas, the Constitution says that the governor shall have power to call forth the militia. That's Article 4, Section 7. Members of the militia are extent, exempt from holding more than one public office, Article 16, Section 40. Um, and this is uh, Texas Code of Criminal Procedure. This county sheriff can order any military company of volunteers or military company from another county. Uh, and then uh, the aid of the military, the county can uh, request the aid of the military militia companies uh, to suppress aid in suppressing riots. The sheriff may, when he supposes there will be a necessity, order such number of citizens of his county or request any military or militia company to aid in preventing the rescue of a prisoner. Uh, reserve militia means persons liable to serve but not serving in the state military forces. Uh, state militia means state military forces or mil reserve militia. State military forces means the Texas National Guard, the Texas State Guard, and any other militia or military force organized under state law. Passport is a, a written document given to a person or persons by a commander of belligerent forces authorizing him or them to travel unmolested within the district occupied by his troops. Passports are issued by the State Department or similar office in other countries to diplomatic agents and others entering or traveling in foreign countries which are the same general characters as those issued during war. The latter should, when practicable, have the photograph of the bearer attached. That's taken from the Rules of Land Warfare, 1914 edition, Passport Safe Conduct, Safeguards and Cartels, Chapter 7, Section 4, Article 276, page 100. You understand the importance of that, though? State Department or other. Yeah. That could be the Republic of Texas, Secretary of State. Could be, yeah. I mean, they've they've uh, there's been people that have worked on passports from time to time, but we need people to participate. There's there's a huge amount of things that need to be done to have it run properly. It is the duty of the patriot to protect his country from its government. Any society that would give up a little liberty to gain a little security will deserve neither and lose both. Never forget the money, men who started this country are marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Government's not the solution, government's the problem. <coughs> the greatest danger to American freedom is a government that ignores the Constitution. That's what's happening right now. When plunder becomes a way of life for a group of men in a society over the course of time, they create for themselves a legal system that authorizes it and a moral code that just glorifies it. That's Bastiat in his book, The Law. The two enemies of the people are criminals and government. So let us tie down the second, the government, with the chains of the Constitution so that the second, the government, will not become the legalized version of the first, criminals. And that's exactly what's happening. None are more hopelessly enslaved than those who falsely believe they're free. If a law is unjust, a man has not only a right to disobey it, he is obligated to do so. That's Jefferson's seal. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. And if you think about it, obedience to tyrants is rebellion to God. Never forget the men who started this country are marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Under international law of warfare, law of warfare, remember the Libra Code, that's all international law. Under international law of warfare, all parties to a cause must appear by non decur because an alien enemy cannot appear and is, uh, cannot maintain an action during the war in his own name. A mixed war is one which is weighed on one side by public authority and the other by mere private persons. At common law, only gold or silver legal tender, that's an 1820 court case, but they're quitting. Book two on the Institutes of the Laws of England, which is Coke in the 1500s. And if you want common law, it requires honest measures. That's why we can't get it, it's because the other side won't give honest measures. No, that's right. They're a bunch of thieves. That's right. 
there's a, that's why I say that's that's why I don't even talk to them. I just I do I do challenge the jurisdiction and take it into the court of appeals and get the court of appeals to slap them. There's a distinction between a debt discharge and one paid. When the debt, when discharged, the debt still exists, though divested of its character as a legal obligation during the operation of the discharge. You know, these bar members will lay awake at night dreaming this stuff up. This discharge falls under, under international law. My contact information, my blog is sovereigntyinternational.wordpress.com. My website is sovereigntyinternational.fyi. My email address is engineer1 at yahoo.com. My YouTube profile is Sovereign Living. My Facebook community page is deleted due to censorship on the part of Facebook. Um, my private group called Sovereign International is being deleted. Quite frankly, I haven't been to Facebook in months, maybe years. And um, technically what I should do is ban everybody off of that group and then delete the group. If I, if I, uh, I Facebook won't let me delete it until I get everybody off of it. It's got 17,000 people on it. And so uh, it would take me months to, to ban everybody off of there. And so I just, uh, I just don't go there. Anyways, I've got a freelist.org private group called Administering Your Public Servants. I've got a Google private group called Administering Your Public Servants. I have a Steemit at Sovereignty International, BitChute at Sovereignty International, and HowTube. That's my subscription channel on HowTube called Sovereignty International. What is proclaiming martial law is no law at all, but merely for the sake of public safety and circumstances of great emergency, setting aside all law and acting under military power. And that's eight attorney general's opinion, February 3rd, 1857. I have exclusive content available on howto.com. It's 999 a month for videos plus unlimited email consultations, but I'm not a liar. Well, I'm in a lawyer. No, I'm in a liar. Uh, but I can tell you what I would do under certain circumstances and where to find the forms. The only power that these New World Order Satanists have over us is through fraud and deception, and my agenda is to expose it for all our benefit, but I cannot fight all the battles. I need other people knowing what's going on. Arlington Private, and some of my website, uh, some of my exclusive content at Arlington Private Information Share, land deed training, estoppel certificates training, foreclosure certificates, Estoppel certificates training, corporate denial training, toll roads notice and demand training, invoice training, notice of void judgment training, revocation signature training, third party witness training, federal habeas corpus training, revocation of voter registration training, criminal complaint training. There's about three videos on that. I'm going to do some more because I've been having some pretty good success recently. Um, I, I think I got the Bedford mayor to resign. Anyways, lawsuit training, I've got one video on that. There needs to be more other training requests. I'm going to have, uh, I've got a video about how to do the challenge of standing. Um, and um, I've got a, another video that I want to do or can, uh, need to do is on doing a petition for rid of mandamus. And uh, every state is different as far as that petition for rid of mandamus. Uh, so um, it's, I've got one for New York, one for Texas one for Nevada, uh, and I'm probably going to do one for maybe New Jersey. Uh, somebody's contacted me about Connecticut now, so, um, um, you know, every time I help someone with that kind of stuff, then I can make a video because I'll, I'll know, because I have to do a bunch of research to do. Every state is going to be a little bit different. Anyways, uh, all forms, I've also got Northeast Private Information Share videos. All forms, files, and other instructions are available for free, linked on my videos and on my website. All exclusive content is on HowTube now, and you can buy a subscription there, and it's uh, HowTube Sovereign International. I'm getting quite a few people buying subscription there. I had some last few days, so it's starting to, uh, I've only had that HowTube up for like about six weeks. Um, Never forget the men who started this country are marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. A bankruptcy and military occupation after concessions to the Pope precipitated the Magna Carta. A bankruptcy and military occupation in colonial days precipitated the War of Independence. A bankruptcy in 1932 and military occupation today is precipitating what is happening now. And it's all coming from the Roman cult. They've replaced the true 13th Amendment with the so-called 13th, current so-called 13th Amendment, 
They've allowed their foreign agents of the Roman cult to infiltrate. 70 to 90 percent of bar of members of Congress and the legislatures are bar members. Bar members are foreign agents of the Roman cult enforcing the martial law. Regency, and people don't get this, okay? They say registry. Well, it's not registry, it's regency. These bar members are regents, okay? Because we don't have a clue. Anybody that has a bar member, if you look in Corpus Juris Secundum, anybody that hires a bar member is an imbecile. And so regency, an office or jurisdiction of a regent or body of regents, a government or authority by regents. A regent is a person who exercises the ruling power in a kingdom during the minority, absent, or other disability of the sovereign, a governor or ruler. All bar members operate in a zip code, that's the District of Columbia. We, the people, have abdicated our responsibility to these bar members, scum. Ends of court. There are certain private, unincorporated associations in the nature of collegiate houses located in London invested with the exclusive privilege of calling men to the bar. That's Black's <laughs> Law Dictionary, page 5th edition. There's the city of London, right there. Most people don't have the courage to share this. This small little country with almost no one has heard about funded all sides of World War II, World War II, and will start World War III if we do not stop them. And that's owned and operated by the Roman cult. If any citizen of the United States shall accept, claim, receive, or retain any title of nobility or honor, or shall without the consent of Congress accept, retain, or any present pension, office, emolument of any kind, whatever, from any emperor, king, prince, or foreign power. So bar members have received a title of nobility and an honor from a foreign power. Such person shall cease to be a citizen of the United States and shall be incapable of holding any office of trust or profit under them or either of them. Does that include Joe Biden? Yeah, right. So they, you know, I don't know if he's got two brain cells. Um, so, so, but the point is, is that under them and either of them, under them is the federal government, either of them is the state government. That's how they describe that. Well, they did away with this under Lincoln so he could become president. I know. Yeah. You know, because he was a bar member and yeah. a lawyer. Right. So. Yeah, they Lincoln, kind of, they disappeared. It disappeared and then, and then he, and then they helped it out so they could, uh, and I've heard that there's a statue of Lincoln over in the city of London, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Anyways, I've heard that. I've heard there's a big statue of Lincoln over in the city of London. Anyways. So many of these people who have been, you know, presidents and so on have been lawyers. I mean, look at, you know. Uh, Obama. Clinton, Obama. <laughs> yeah. So I know. Yielding and paying yearly to us, our heirs and successors, for the same, the yearly rent 20 marks of lawful money of England at the Feast of All Saints yearly forever, the first payment thereof to begin and be made on the Feast of All Saints, which shall be in the year of our Lord 1665, and also one fourth part of all gold and silver ore, which within the limits of our percent shall from time to time happen to be found. Now, that's the Carolina Charter of 1663. Now, if anybody's ever looked at the map of that, that goes coast to coast. So parts of California are in the Carolina Charter. Whereas, uh, we already read this one. Today is the Feast of All Saints. It's so all Saints. Yeah, it's all Yeah. And biblical scholars trace it back to be the time is that right? So, so these disembodied spirits have these practicing Sawin, which is the you know the most unholy day of the year. Wow! Uh, because they're it's a commemoration of, of the death of their children. Their well, that's friend. that's interesting. <coughs> Martial law affects chiefly the police and the collection of public revenue and taxes, whether imposed by the expelled government or by the invader, and refers mainly to the efficiency of the army its safety and the safety of its operations. That's why they're always saying, be safe, be safe. And and so, um, papers please. So they're, they're just nothing but a bunch of thieves. 
They're bringing District of Columbia outside 10 miles square. Taxes cause the War of Independence. If they can tax you, then you're their slave. You're forced to work for them for nothing. It's becoming more and more difficult to be free. Felonies mean nothing unless they have some political agenda. So they, just because they commit a felony doesn't mean anything. They, they just ignore it. There's two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by sword and the other is by debt. Never forget the men who started this country are marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. On December, on Christmas Eve, 24th of December, uh, 20, 1913, in the middle of the night, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, setting up the scenario for the next bankruptcy. It took less than 20 years for the Federal Reserve banksters to set up the next bankruptcy. Most of the congressmen and presidents. I know. Since March 9, 1933, the United States has been a state of declared national emergency. Okay, so March 9, 1933, that's 19 years and three months. Under the powers delegated by these statutes, the president may seize property, organize and control the means of production, seize commodities, assign military forces abroad, institute martial law, seize and control all transportation and communication, regulate the operation of private enterprise, restrict travel and unemployed authority of particular ways, control the lives of all American citizens. The majority of the people of the United States have lived all their lives under emergency rule. For 40 years, freedoms and governmental procedures guaranteed by the Constitution <laughs> have in varying degrees been abridged by laws brought into force by states of national emergency. And that's in re, uh, U.S. Senate Report number 993-549, dated November 19th, 1973. And do you think anything's changed? Absolutely not. They don't know what real freedom is, the people. They don't. A lot of them don't. You're right. On the same day, see, March 9th, 1933, on the same day, it's an established fact that the United States federal government has been dissolved by the Emergency Banking Act, March 9, 1933, 48 Stat 1, Public Law 89-719, declared by President Roosevelt being bankrupt and insolvent. H.J.R. 192, 73rd Congress, in session June 5, 1933, joint resolution to suspend the gold standard and abrogate the gold clause, dissolve the sovereign authority of the United States and the official law, official capacities of all United States governmental offices, officers, and departments, and as further evidence that the United States federal government exists today in name only. That's Congressional Record, March 17, 1993. Traffic contact. Sorry? By New York Senator Traffic contact. Yes, it was. Yeah. Actually, I think it was a Minnesota Senator. Might have been. But I know his name was or he was a representative. Actually, he was a representative. He wasn't even a senator. I think yeah. he was just a representative. Anyways, so you have judge wears a military uniform. Judge sits there and plays stupid. If you fail to follow some obscure rule or procedure, they sell you into slavery. Everything they do is a fraud and a nullity. It's all corporate law. you got to understand it's all corporate law. Judge works with state. Prosecutor works with state. Police and witness works with state. The vast majority of the disputes that the police initiate on behalf of their employer are also adjudicated by their employer, where the plaintiff, the judge, the antagonist, the police, the only witness, also the police, all represent the same party. And since no corpus delecti, mens reus or ex reus can be produced, doesn't technically qualify to be heard according to its own laws. State, therefore, is indistinguishable from a criminal cartel. It's all corporate laws, what it is. That's why the challenge to standing works so good. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude is except as punishment for a crime where the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist in the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. And so, again, this is United States, that's District of Columbia. And, uh, and uh, he the prisoner, this is the, that's the current 13th <laughs> Amendment, that's what that is. He the prisoner has as a consequence of his crime not only forfeited his liberty, but all his personal rights except those which the law and its humanity affords him, he is for the time being a slave of the state. It's all slavery. If we were Christians, we'd put a stop to that. Amen. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. My history of the Jesuits is all coming from the Roman cult. 
My history of the Jesuits is not eloquently written, but it is supported by unquestionable authorities and is very particular and very horrible. There, the Jesuit order's restoration in 1814 by Pope Pius VII is indeed a start, step towards darkness, cruelty, despotism, and death. I do not like the appearance of the Jesuits as ever there was a body of merit, merited eternal damnation on earth and in hell. It is the society of Ignatian de Loyola. John Adams, second president of the United States. Within 20 years, this country is going to rule the world. Kings and emperors will soon pass away, and the democracy of the United States will take their place. When the United States rules the world, the Catholic Church will rule the world. Nothing can stand against the Church. And that's Roman Catholic Archbishop James E. Quigley, Chicago Daily Tribune, May 5th, 1903. Oh, and there's the Roman Conquest, 24th of September, 2015. All that red text is really hard to read. So uh, what we'll do is we'll, I got it on the next slide is what the text shows. Uh, but so that we'll start on this corner over here. And this text is, this arrow is pointing at this military Ikea staff right here. And, um, and there's the pimp. Well, I meant the Pope. You know, it's interesting he wears white. Eh? He saw like he's so pure and everything, you know. And it's really Satan embodied on this planet is what that is. Anyways, don't get me going. Well, he um, himself as an angel of light. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He certainly does. Yeah, exactly. Those, yes. Those emblems up, uh, up there on either side of the patchy. We're going to talk about that. Yeah. He went by his fish head. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, okay. The, that, that first arrow is pointing at that Roman Achaea military staff carried in battle by all Roman commands, planted on all conquered nations. Okay, so that's this first text right here, pointing at that arrow right there. And then the second text right here is pointing at this is Biden. That's right here. Devout Roman Catholic honorary degree in Jesuit Scranton University. And then the next one is right here, and it's pointing at the fascists that Jason was talking about. Yep. Which, is the root, which is the root word of what? Fascism. And it's also on the uh, arm, arms of uh, the Lincoln Memorial. Right. Because he's a fascist. So what he's is our first fascist ruler. So what is the definition of fascism? That's the rule. That's a merger of corporations and state. Yes. So if the United States is a corporation. corporation. Right, exactly. They it's fascist. They, They're all fascist. Yeah. Um, the fasc Roman bundle of rods bound to a weapon symbolizing subservient under the rule of a single man. Okay, so it's pointing at these fascists. And then this last one here is pointing at Beaner. Ro devout Roman Catholic trained by Jesuits installed the first Jesuit chaplain to the house. So uh, that's what that's what this is anyway. So it's Roman conquest when the pimp came to talk to the uh, to Congress. Um, Congress is owned and operated by the Roman cult. On behalf of the Roman cult, Congress has been very been imposing a military dictatorship on everyone in America. Why do you think Pelosi gets up there? Did get up there and say, we can't read this bill until after we pass it. So I think that speaks volumes for herself. She's doing what she, what her handlers want her to do. <laughs> Justice is coming. Okay, this is Obama and the pimp laughing and chuckling, having a good old time. And, and he doesn't look happy with Trump there, does he? <laughs> Justice is coming. I think that's probably the case. If a man be found stealing any of his brethren of the children of Israel, and maketh merchandise of him, or sell of him, then that thief shall die. Thou shalt put evil away from among you. If we were Christians, we'd put all that slavery, we'd put a stop to that. Mark Passio, a former Satanist priest, says that 90% of Americans are practicing Satanists. Yes. We're reaping the curses found in Deuteronomy 28, 15 to, 6, 15 to 68. And... Um, um, so it's time to repent. In this chapter, this is Texas Government Code 431.001. Reserve militia means persons liable to serve but not serving in the state military forces. State militia means 
state military forces and reserve militia. State military forces means um, um, means the Texas National Guard, the State National Guard, any other active militia or military force organized under state law. So remember what, what it said in that book. It's the militia of Texas, right? right. Or the Texas militia. Texas, yeah. It's a Texas militia. Right. And it's not called anything else, I'll okay? I, so it's, else. that's right. So it's not state militia. It's not, it's Texas militia. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's not called that. The militia, let me finish. The militia cannot be called up by anyone to suppress insurrections or repel invasions if they're not organized and ready to be called up. Um, we will either have our constitutional homeland security or a police state. The choice is ours. Right now, we have a police state. Currently, a bigger percentage of the Texas population is incarcerated. Uh, than the worst dictatorship in the Soviet Union and communist China. Never forget the men who started this country were marijuana-growing, whiskey-drinking, tax-evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. Trump, my new book is available. It's actually been out for a couple of years, but uh, Trump, a true American patriot or not. Um, the, uh, the, Mike Blackwell actually asked me to write the book. And it took me about six weeks because all I did is took a lawsuit and manipulated it and turned it into the book. But he hired a company to help us publish it. And uh, they wrote this stuff on the back. And I think they kind of nail it here. So I'm just going to read this. It says, uh, in Trump, a true American patriot or not, Glenn Fern and Mike Blackwell reveal the depths of corruption, deceit, and manipulation infesting our political system for hundreds of years, regardless of political affiliation. Um, Read the hard evidence that exposes how our elected officials sold Americans into slavery. Uh, understand the Founding Fathers' true intent when they formed our Republican form of government. Discover the influence of the satanic Roman cult on our politicians and political system. Does Donald Trump want to transfer power back to we the people? In Trump, you'll see the great battle that is upon us, and I think he nails it. They nail it there. Now, Mike asked me to write the book. And I wrote the book, but then he had to babysit me for six months getting ready to publish. So that's why I put him on the book, quite frankly. But but I wrote the book. You can order the book from Amazon or from my website. It's $40 plus shipping. I prefer you order from my website. Amazon does not provide autographed books. If you want the book autographed and you want to say something special, let me know. You want to know the origins of the deep state, who's behind it? You want to know why it's called the Trump administration or the Biden administration? It's all tied to the Roman cult. You want to know what an administration is? You want to know how Trump came to be president? You want to know who owns Congress? You know, Trump was invited. We're going to talk about that a little bit. You want to know why they're called law enforcement officers? Because they're enforcing the martial law. Do you want to know how you have become a slave? Do you want to know what the root cause of the War of Independence was? It's in the book. It's the same thing that's happening now. Do you want to know why every president goes to visit the Pope on their first international trip? It's all in the book. It's part of an administration. Mike Blackwell asked me to write the book. Uh, Trump was invited. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Jerome Corsi. He's a uh, guy that lives up in the Northeast. He's got a YouTube channel, a website. He's got a PhD in political science, and he's written a bunch of books. Um, anyways, there's a YouTube video where he says that in 2015, five generals came to see him, and they said they were going to overthrow Obama. And he said, well, you can do that if you want, but you might want to go talk to Donald Trump first. Three months later, he gets a phone call. They decided not to overthrow Obama because Donald Trump had agreed for him for president. So, um, anyways, this book is 95% provable facts uh, because I took a lawsuit and manipulated it. So I used law dictionary definitions, international treaties, court cases, all sorts of stuff to prove everything I say. But some of it's opinion. And my opinion is that all of these billionaires get approached by the New World Order crowd and you get told that you're going to go along with our program or you're going to turn up dead. And, um, and I think Donald Trump was... Uh, was uh, notified 
I think that Howard Hughes also, you remember how Howard Hughes was hiding out? At the time I wrote this book, I thought that maybe it's just because he'd been approached. But uh, the uh, David Wilcox says that in after World War II, Howard Hughes got blackballed and he couldn't get any defense contracts with the military industrial complex. And so he uh, got some women to go and sleep with the military industrial complex types and find out from Pillow Talk what, why he wasn't getting any contracts. And that's when he found out that they were planning on doing what they're doing right now. And they want to kill off 90% of us and all that stuff. Eh? Anyways, so he had published a set of manuals and procedures, and, and, and Kennedy was implementing that stuff. Remember, Kennedy circulated $6 billion worth of U.S. Treasury notes. That's like telling the, federal, telling the banksters you're done. Silverback day. No, they were just treasury notes. They were just treasury notes. But so, so that was like telling the treasury. That matter of fact, I've got some. I've got some five dollar bills that are just treasury notes. Silverbacks. No, they they weren't silverbacks. Isn't that one of what they're no, no, they no. They they silver. there was some. There was some silver certificates Certificate before that. Right. Before that, in the fifties, I think it was Eisenhower that did that. Right. But. Um, Anyways, so so um, so where was I going with it? Yeah. So I think that's why he was hiding out. It's because no, he was hiding out. He was he was he actually he he bought a hotel in in Las Vegas and he he took the whole top floor for himself. Yeah. And he never left. What happened is he. Used to watch movies at night. Yeah. They wouldn't play the movies he wanted, so he said, "I'm just going to buy this casino." And that's what he did. He went on to that casino. Right. So, anyways, same thing I think happened with Howard Trump. Uh, uh, no, Donald Trump, because uh, there was a helicopter crash in 1984, and um, uh, I happen to know a little bit about helicopters, and it crashed because the blades came off. I've never ever heard of a helicopter crashing because the blades come off. And um, they have special life-limited parts. Those bolts are life-limited. There's no way those blunt bolts would ever fail. Something happened. And so, anyways, I think it was... He was he had three executives on there, and he was supposed to be on there himself, and he canceled it out at the last minute. And, um, and he lost three executives. In reality, they're not after me. They're after you. I'm just in the way. And so, Trump... Um, and I'm giving you your country back from the criminal psychopaths who stole it from you, and half of you don't even know it yet. And, and I think he's right. Um, so some current events. And some of you listened to that 107 video we listened to last week. Um, this is going to talk a little bit about that. Um, about 18 months before Trump's first indictment, I got an email. And it said he would be indicted, but don't worry, it's all part of the show. And so, and then just before his first indictment, he actually came out and said, I am your retribution. If you've been wronged by the deep state, when I get back into power, I'm going to fix it. And, and so, so they're shitting bricks. Okay. They know that they're done. And, and, uh, just before the most recent indictment, Trump came out and started to talk about public hangings, okay? So they, they, they're going to get put to death, and they know it. So they're doing absolutely, it's, it's basically do or die, you know what I mean? And so that's why they're in, in, in complete panic, and, and nothing they're doing is working. It all gets defeated. And uh, Biden doesn't have the 747, by the way. Uh, that airplane that he was when he tripped on the steps going up, that wasn't the 747. That was a 787. I don't know who's got the 747. I don't know if Trump has it, but Biden doesn't have the 747. And the White House has been vacant. He's got, he's got a cheap paint job on a, on a 787. Yeah, yeah. So they have, they have the White House has been vacant too, and, and except for security. They've got security people in there. And, and But nobody's mowing the grass. There's people that have done YouTube videos and, and going to the White House, and the grass is all overgrown. Nobody's mowing the grass. And so what happened, what I heard happened, is that 
I don't know if you remember on when on the election night when uh, um, what's her name Sidney Powell was went home and was supposed to prepare the insurrection act for Trump to sign it and and then she came back the next day and Mark Meadows had revoked her pass and people called Mark Meadows a traitor and all this stuff and um, but what I've found out or what I've heard I don't know how true it is but there's good reason to think that it's true anyways what I've heard is that Trump was planning on signing the Insurrection Act, and overnight he had he held meetings all the time in the middle of the night. And it was actually 107 that talked about this. He said that Trump used to hold meetings all the time in the middle of the night. And, and he said some generals came to see him, and they told him that he could sign the Insurrection Act. It was within his authority. But that when Lincoln signed the Insurrection Act, within six months there was a civil war. And he said that, uh, that uh, and they believed the same thing would happen again. And they said that they had gamed out all sorts of civil war scenarios and the republic does not survive. And, and so, so uh, Trump decided not to sign the Insurrection Act and he had to wake the people up to what's going on. And so, I mean, he's certainly been doing that. You know, I am your retribution, you know, and talk about public hangings. He's making those people just, they're just in sheer panic mode. And so he's, he's, been, he's been doing that. This is what he came out with before, before that first indictment. For those of you for, who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. <laughs> so he's jerking their chain. He's doing it on purpose. And, and so anyways, never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. So we have a renegade government with a stolen election imposing a tyranny. We have millions of military age people, mostly men invading our country. The state militia started the war of independence. The many of the governors at the time were supporting the crown. We the people said no to the tyranny of the British crown. We the people are gonna have to step up because the same things that precipitated the war of independence are happening today again. We're all born for a time such as this. This is the uh, causes and necessities for taking up arms, 1775. The uh, uh, the war of, uh, statutes have been passed extending the courts of admiralty and vice admiralty far beyond our ancient limits for depriving us of the accustomed and inestimable privilege of trial by jury in cases affecting both life and property to supersede the course of common law and instead thereof to publish and order the use and exercise of the law martial. So they imposed, the crown imposed martial law. We saw the misery to which this despotism would reduce us, that's dictatorship, folks. And so that's taken from the cause and necessities of taking up arms, 1775. The war of independence was because the crown had imposed a military dictatorship on the colonies. The, this is the Declaration of Independence, and you have to understand the Declaration of Independence is a list of grievances, okay? It starts off, we the people, um, uh, let's see, it's, um, I have to think of the exact, um, there's a, a preamble. There's, yes, that's right. There's a preamble, and, it's, and we talked about it earlier, but, uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit here in a minute. But anyway, so, it, but it's a list of grievances. And so some of the grievances are he's endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, right? Well, isn't that what Biden's doing? He's encouraging all these people to come across the border. You see what I'm saying? He's obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws establishing judiciary powers. Gee, that sounds like kangaroo courts. He's erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. Well, that sounds like military police everywhere, code enforcers, all sorts of crap. He's affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. Well, that's talking about martial law for sure. He's combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution, unacknowledged by our laws, which is talking about martial law, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation. Well, that's color of law. And, and so... And that's exactly what's going on for protecting them by a mock trial. Kangaroo courts, show trials, denials of due process, 
if there's anywhere you'll get your rights violated, it's in the so-called courts. And so for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. Well, gee, that sounds like bringing color of law outside not exceeding 10 miles square. That's exactly what they're talking about there. I mean, if you look in that, in that uh, SESCAV Trust Act of 1666, it talks about beyond seas in there. You see what I'm saying? So beyond seas is outside the District of Columbia. For abolishing the, the free system of English laws, laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government enlarging its boundaries so as to render at once a fit an, an example and fit instrument for in, introducing the same absolute rule. Gee, that's into these colonies, bringing the District of Columbia dictatorship outside not exceeding 10 miles square. For imposing taxes on us without our consent. These are all grievances that were listed in the Declaration of Independence. For taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, altering fundamentally the forms of our government. That's military dictatorship. For suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. Gee, that sounds like military dictatorship. He's abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. Martial law, military dictatorship under the Trading with the Enemy Act. He's destroyed the lives of our people, populating jails with commercial transactions. Texas is a bigger percentage of people in jail in the worst communist dictatorship, more than China, more than the Soviet Union. And this is the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. You know the thing. <laughs> Sorry? Biden started that meeting. He goes, you know the thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> okay, so the underlying parts that I want to go over is that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. And, and then it goes on uh, to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles as organized and powers, in such form as to them shall deem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. That, and accordingly, all experience have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations isn't that what's happening today? A long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. That's dictatorship. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new safeguards for their security. Now, I'm not saying we have to throw off our government because it's our government. There's nothing our domestic enemies would love more than for us to take up arms against our government. The law is on our side. Our Constitution was inspired by God. We need to peacefully and lawfully form our militias and let our government officials know we're there to support them in their lawful duty. Okay? And it's, I am positive that many of our public servants would love for us to step up and give them a reason to honor their oaths. I am positive. There's lots of good ones out there. You listen to Randy Kelton and stuff, you know, and, and so I'm telling you, there's lots of them that, are, that really don't like doing what they have to do, and they would love to, to have an opportunity to honor their oath. And we need to go over there and talk to them and make sure you understand what the Constitution is. Because they don't sure. Absolutely, and, and, and talk to him. I think the county sheriff is a good place to start. I hope Trump is who he says he is, and I believe he is. In any event, it cannot come from one man. It has to come from all of us. If Trump is who he says he is, he needs to know we're at his back. If he's not who he says he is, and it comes from all of us, it won't matter. Because there's more arms in the hands of the American people and there isn't every other army on the planet combined. We decide what our destiny is. We are at war whether we like it or not. And the fate of the planet is in our hands. The whole planet's watching us. 
We're the only nation that has the right to keep and bear arms. Yes. That's right. You know, because we're commanded not to murder, but there are times we are commanded to kill. That's why well, we have to we have to defend ourselves. Well, that's one example right there. But also, you have to defend your country. That's right. How, how often were the Israelites called to? That's right. Defend their country. That's right. That's right. And that's perfectly legitimate in the eyes of God. Defend yourself. That's right. Defend your family. Defend your country. That's right. You know, defend our our right to our religious beliefs. Jesus himself said, "There will come a day when you need to sell your cloak and buy a sword." That's right. Of course, a, a, you know. A, well, today it'll be an AK-47. <laughs> yeah, and a hatchet. I'd like a hatchet. I heard that, 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 that these guys, these guys, and 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 the Marines and stuff, they love because a hatchet. I'll tell you, you know, that that ends the discussion right there. <laughs> Anyways, um, the hanging tree. Okay, this is obviously a drawing. I think uh, maybe a painting. Uh, anyways. Um, you know, I think that we might see this kind of thing happen. Um, I think that most of our public servants are good, honorable people. And I, I, you know, I certainly wouldn't do anything like this without making sure they got due process. And, and uh, even though they deny us due process all the time, uh, I would, I would want to make sure they got due process. And, um, and so, <laughs> well, if, if they get convicted, they get convicted, you know, it's, that's that's right. Swiftly is right. The Bible says that if they they got to be taken down before sundown, so it's got to happen and, and it's done and they're taken down before sundown. Anyways, um, so uh, never forget the men who started this country were marijuana growing, whiskey drinking, tax evading rebels who left their beds at night to shoot at the cops. But the watchmen see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among you, he's taken away in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hands. Either you're part of the problem or you're part of the solution. You are now a watchman. Circulate this video far and wide. And that's the end. Thank you very much.